So, as Federica was saying, uh, I am interested in studying uh, T lymphocyte activation, and uh, I have been used, using uh, uh, mostly as a cellular models human T lymphocytes, either helper or cytotoxic T lymphocytes, interacting with uh, autologous antigen presenting cells loaded with uh, uh, antigenic peptides or with super antigen. And as you know uh, from the literature, when the T cell receptor here, depicted here, <laughs> enter in contact with its own ligands, the peptide MHC complexes that are displayed on the surface of the APC that you should imagine here, here is the T cell, here is the APC. When this uh, complex receptor enters in contact with its, its own ligand, a complex cascade of events is triggered in the T cell, and all this uh, signaling cascade converge in the nucleus of the T cell to activate the interleukin genes and so to start the adaptive immune response. I will go not go through this uh, uh, detailed pathways in this presentation, but this slide is here only to remind uh, a very central uh, aspect in uh, T cell antigen re recognition, and that is uh, that in physiological condition, the encounter of the, T of the T cell receptor with its own ligand, the peptide MHC complex, occurs always at the contact site between two cells, the T cell from one side and the APC on the other side. Therefore, to study with a, a physiological approach the T cell receptor signaling, it's important to study cell-cell interaction. And this is actually what we did since many years when I was uh, still in Basel, the interaction between cells and their uh, dynamics. As you know, studies from different uh, groups, starting from uh, Avi Kupfer group, uh, um, Michael Dustin groups, and others, have put forth uh, the notion that when the T cell enters in contact with the APC, signaling pathways are not organized like we are depicted in this uh, scheme like this, but actually signaling components, surface molecules, and uh, intracellular structures get reorganized in a uh, specialized signaling areas named immunological synapse. The immunological synapse was described in its original uh, classical description as a concentric area formed by a central area named central supramolecular activation cluster, CISMAC, where the T cell receptor, co-receptors, signaling molecules, and cytoskeleton were converging. A peripheral ring around this area made by additional molecules such as LF1, ICAN1, that are some sort of anchors that allow the T cells to stay attached on the, the cognate APC in order to allow the T cell receptor to have time to signal. And more in the periphery, there was the DISMAC, the distal supramolecular activation cluster, where um, large and highly glucosylated molecules such as CD45 were excluded from the central signaling area. Um, the contribution of our research team uh, has contributed to describe the structure, the molecular architecture of the immunological synapse, but the most important contribution we made to the field was to put forth the notion that immunological synapses, both in helper T lymphocytes and in cytotoxic T lymphocytes, are not always like this central structure we, I described here, but they can vary in their uh, structure depending on the condition of stimulation and on the responses that the T cells will give. And also the synapses are endowed of a high degree of motility, uh, dan uh, dynamism, and somehow they have some plasticity that allow them, T cells, to communicate with different APC simultaneously and by this way be more efficient. I will uh, divide my uh, seminar in two parts. In the first part, I will speak about the, some data on the TL per cell immunological synapses. And the second part, I will discuss about data on cytotoxic T cell immunological synapses. Concerning the TL per cells, I will very quick, briefly report uh, what we did uh, about the plasticity of the L per cell synapses. And after, I will uh, uh, present some new data we have about the TL per synapse in human pathologies. Concerning our contribution to the idea that the immunological synapse formed by CD4 helper T cells are, plast are plastic, somehow are endowed of plasticity, I will uh, just summarize this data in one slide. We uh, 
uh, a student in the lab, David Dupois, who is now working with uh, uh, Michael Dustin, showed that when uh, helper T cells are forced to interact simultaneously with different antigen cells offering different strength of antigenic stimulation, the helper T cells depicted here in green choose among the different cells and they polarize their secretory machinery, their CD40 ligand, their cytokines, towards the APC offering at any given time the best antigenic stimulation in order to choose towards which APC the help should be given. More recently, Flori Bertrand, another student in the lab, showed that this uh, uh, phenomenon can be achieved by the helper T cells via the activation at the synapse of a polarizing enzyme, a polarizing pathway, that is the pathway of the PKC zeta. And she also showed that, that this dedicated polarization of the T helper help provides some advantage to the antigen presenting cell as, for example, the capacity of dendritic cells to produce IL-12 in a cognate fashion. Another student in the lab, uh, Michael Escheres, showed that uh, um, uh, Treg, that are known, to, are known to inhibit different uh, aspects of adaptive immune response, have developed a mechanism to inhibit this rapid and dedicated polarization of helper T cells towards the um, APCs, by a mechanism that requires the secretion of the TGF beta. Another postdoc in, in the lab, um, Sophie Duchet, showed that when helper T cells enter in contact with uh, untransformed B cells, not only the helper T cell, but also the B cell polarize towards each other at the immunological <laughs> synapse. They give sort of kisses one to the other indicating that somehow B cells speak back to the T cells at the immunological synapse, probably in a mechanism that might facilitate the antigen present presentation to helper T lymphocytes. Results that are somehow reminiscent from what uh, we have shown uh, with uh, the dendritic cells. So altogether, this, idea, this data put forth the idea that helper T cells form dynamic synapses that allow them to choose among the different APCs towards which they uh, deliver their um, help. More recently, we have been uh, interested in uh, uh, T helper cells in human pathology, and most uh, in, uh, precisely, we focused on a um, sort of uh, uh, unconventional synapses formed between T helper cells and mast cells, and we are studying the implication of these synapses in human pathology. The idea that mast cells could present antigenic determinants to CD4 class 2 restricted T lymphocytes was in the air, was proposed since a long time, but was also somehow controversial because it was not really sure if mast cells could really form cognate interaction with helper T cells, provide antigenic stimuli and activate them, or whether this was an artifact of the cultures in which mast cells might die be phagocyted by contaminant dendritic cells, and the dendritic cells via a sort of uh, um, cross-presentation might make the job of presenting the, the antigens to the T cells. To solve this uh, question, to show in a, in, a, in, um, uh, in a clear manner that the, the T cells could recognize antigenic determinants on the surface of mast cells, we formed the immunological synapse among the cells, and we showed so that actually these synapses can be formed. Mast cells can pretend, uh, present antigenic determinants to T cells that polarize towards them. And this results in an activation of uh, uh, T cells to proliferation and to cyclonal production, so the T cells get activated to do so. But it also, also results in the activation of mast cells, because mast cells that have interacted with T cells um, can be more responsive to their stimuli, as shown, for example, here in the shifting towards the left of the dose response curve of degranulation of mast cells when they are aggregated in the FC epsilon receptor, this uh, degranulation is more sensitive if the mast cell has formed cognate interaction with T cells. These data were uh, done by a PhD student in the lab, uh, Nicola Godenzio, who is going to leave to Stanford very, very soon, in, and with the help of a junior professor in the, in the lab, um, Eric Spinoza. What they did was to find a way to uh, prime the mast cells to uh, present antigenic determinants, so to upregulate on their surface uh, MHC class 2 molecules plus the, let's say, the synthetic uh, pathway, 
Um, that is a, co a combination of treatment for a few days with interferon gamma and uh, uh, IL-4 uh, uh, IL together. These uh, data were originally made in a mouse model that you all know. But more recently, we asked whether also human mast cells might serve as antigen, antigen presenting cells for uh, class um, two restricted T lymphocytes. And if this will be the case, would, would be, what will be the impact of this uh, an, uh, anti, um, antigen presentation mediated by mast cells on helper T cell biology? <clears throat> for this reason, Nicola and Rick developed a, a, a method to, uh, uh, to generate mast cell and transformed mast cell lines from human blood. The cells were characterized in their, all their mast cell uh, biological, functional, and phenotypical uh, uh, aspects that I don't present all in detail. And these cells were used to form immunological synapse with um, human T lymphocytes. In this case, uh, the helper cells were polyclonal lines stimulated by uh, the bacterial superantigen TSST1. So these were uh, V-beta-2 human T lymphocytes stimulated by mast cells loaded with TSST1. And we showed that these uh, mast cells could form immunological synapses with uh, uh, helper T lymphocytes characterized here by the enrichment of the CD3 and the phosphotyrosine. And uh, by this way, indicating that also in the case of, help of um, uh, human mast cells, helper T lymphocytes could be activated by these cells in a specific manner. So we asked what could be the outcome of an interaction between an helper T cell and a uh, mast cells. To address this question, we used a memory T lymphocytes because in physiology, it's likely that the cells that might enter, might enter in contact with mast cells are rather in memory T lymphocytes, cells that have been already activated in, um, uh, secondary, uh, organ uh, in lymphoid secondary organs by disease, and after they move to the tissues where they might encounter mast cells. I, I must, must mention, because I learned this from, uh, from Eric, who is a mast cell expert, because I, I ignored this, mast cells are extremely abundant in peripheral tissues like skin or mucosa. They are much more abundant than macrophages and maybe even dendritic cells. So they are really extremely abundant cells that might serve as partners for T cells. So uh, we, address, uh, we, we stimulated um, memory human T lymphocytes with anti-CD3, CD28 coated beads as a sort of a cellular stimulation with uh, uh, LPS-activated disease, human disease, or with uh, human mast cells that were treated with interferon gamma in order to up regulate their, um, their antigen presentation uh, pathway. And we observed the kind of cytokines produced by T helper cells. And what we, we found in this kind of analysis is that T helper cells, when stimulated by mast cells, could produce a large amount of interferon gamma, similarly to disease. But also, surprisingly, they were produced, producing in a large fraction uh, of cells IL-22. Normally, the IL-22 producing cells are very rare in our peripheral blood cells. They were somehow primed by interaction for a few days with mast cells. They made a deep characterization of this kind of cytokine profile. Don't be scared about this presentation. You should only focus on this by, by measuring either the, uh, the uh, number of produce, the fraction of producing cells of different cytokines, the number of cells, absolute number of cells, or the released cytokines in the culture medium. Uh, Nicola and Eric could show that when the T cells interact with mast cells, they produce uh, in a large fraction of these cells, they can produce interferon gamma, but also a specially large fraction compared to the DC and to the beads, they can produce IL-22. Somehow, the presence of mast cells in the culture prime the T cells to produce high number of high level of uh, IL-22 as confirmed also by the other data. We wanted to know whether these cells that were producing IL-22 were uh, pure IL-22 producing cells, what uh, we call TH-22, or whether these cells could have a mixed phenotype, because as you can see here, they were also producing interferon gamma. To do so, we um, gated on the cells that produce uh, IL-22 
either in the case of anti-CD3, CD28 stimulated cells, so, so this is a small fraction, or in the case of uh, cells that were stimulated by mast cells, so this large fraction of IL-22. And we look at, in this condition, whether the cells could co-express interferon gamma. And uh, uh, please focus uh, in uh, this uh, situation. The cells that were interferon gamma positive, so, so in the case of the anti-CD3, CD28 uh, stimulated cells, some cells were, uh, um, were uh, only um, IL-22 positive. Other cells were interferon gamma also positive, so they co-expressed interferon gamma and IL-22, but very few cells were uh, um, uh, IL-70 positive. So in the case of this small fraction of IL-22 cells induced by beads, a large portion of them was a pure TH2, TH22. So like uh, usually happens in uh, peripheral blood, the TH2 cells uh, produce mostly only I IL-22. On the contrary, in the condition in which we focused on this population of mast cell-induced IL-22 cells, there was a um, clear population of these cells, a large population, producing also interferon gamma, indicating that this mast cell priming induced in the same cells production of IL-22 and interferon gamma, a sort of new T cell population. So this is the conclusion of this data. I didn't present it here, but this induction of IL-22 interferon gamma production required the signaling via the TNF-alpha and IL-6 um, uh, receptor in T cells. So these were the findings. And the idea was if the mast cell can present antigen and induce a peculiar population in helper T human helper T cells, could, can this uh, interaction be found in um, uh, human inflamed tissues? To answer this question, we focused on psoriasis, since this skin disease is known since a long time to be dependent, strongly dependent on the production of IL-22, it's not a long time, since a few years, known to be dependent on the production of IL-22. IL-22 production is somehow a critical event in the development of the disease. So we asked whether uh, T cells, CD4 positive T cells and mast cells might encounter each other in this kind of disease. And we observed that as compared to non-lesional skin, look, non-lesional skin, non skin has a very uh, thin epidor epidermoid stratus. Look here, the very big uh, stratus of the, of the psoriatic skin. And uh, you can, uh, in, in the psoriatic skin, as compared to the non-lesional skin, there is a strong infiltrate of both cells, and cells are frequently found in contact to each other, forming sort of pseudo-synaptic contact between the two cells. This is uh, the, the, the scoring of this kind of data. Moreover, we wanted to know whether these cells were producing, these CD4 cells entering in contact with mast cells were producing IL-22. This kind of staining was very difficult. We discussed today how, how difficult can be the, sometimes the stainings, because IL-22, even in vitro, is not very easy to be stained. It's not like, uh, you know, interferon or uh, IL-4 that is detectable in the, in the Golgi. It's a little bit uh, spiky on the cells. And also in tissues was very difficult. We made the best we could that was to use a tricolor uh, immuno, immuno histochemistry. And by this way, we could find a strong infiltrate of the two cells in, uh, in the psoriatic tissues. And also we could find frequent contact between IL-22 positive cells and mast cells identified by a mast cell marker. And most importantly, when we scored the number of IL-22 cells present in different patients, in the samples from different patients, the large fraction of IL-22 positive cells were found in contact with mast cells, indicating that this sort of uh, functional interaction might occur in this disease and might be implicated in the production of IL-22 that uh, is so important for the disease development. So this data uh, uh, allowed us to put forth this um, hypothesis. We consider mast cells as a sort of unconventional antigen-presenting cells that are present in our tissues in the periphery, very strategically located close to the entry of possible pathogens, you know, because they are in skin and mucosa. And uh, they can enter in contact with uh, already experienced uh, T cells, memory T cells that come from uh, 
the circulation from the uh, lymphoid organs. The production interferon gamma from T helper cells themselves or from NK cells or other sources might prime mast cells to become antigen presenting cells. We co consider them like sort of fuel station. So the T cell goes in the tissue, enters in contact with the mast cells and get reactivated by the presence of this cell there, sort of fueling. But also by this interaction, cognitive interaction, mast cells can induce Cells, T, T cells that produce interferon gamma from one side and IL-22 on the other side. And these kind of cytokines are important for the skin defense, for example, in the case of the skin, because these in, in interleukins, in particular uh, interleukin-22, are involved in uh, defense of the skin against bacteria and so on. But in a situation of inflammation, like in psoriasis, the rich infiltrate of these cells might make uh, a sort of, of uh, negative loop, a sort of dangerous liaison among the cells that is amplified, and this amplified the production of IL-22 might be implicated in uh, disease development. So I would, uh, uh, I would stop here in, in the case of the, of, the, of the TH cells. I'm sorry, this should be not red, it should be black, and we should have this in, in red, just to say that I'm going now to speak about the CTL immunological synapse, and I will before speak about the plasticity of CTL immunological synapse in vitro, <laughs> and after, at the end, I will discuss about how we study CTL synapses in human pathology. Concerning the first part, I will present again what today has been presented during the thesis. I will discuss about the mechanism by which the CTL deliver their, um, their lytic granules uh, towards the, the target cells. In a previous studies, we observed that the CTLs, like similarly to the helper cells, exhibit some sort of plasticity of their immunological synapses because uh, we observed that the CTLs interacting simultaneously with the different target cells can deliver the lytic granules shown here in red, not to one target cells only, but irrespectively of the strength of antigenic stimulation, CTL tend to, in, to send the, their lytic granules towards the different target cells simultaneously. And by this way, they behave as multiple killers, a mechanism that might make them extremely efficient in the annihilation of the target cells. So for students, I like to make this kind of comparison. I showed you before that the helper T cells are extremely plastic in their synapse, and they can touch different cells and choose among different cells to decide towards which polarize. On the contrary, the CTLs, they do the opposite. The CTLs, somehow, when they enter in contact with the target cells, they send their granules toward the target cells. But this makes sense. Because if I am an helper T cells, and, do, and you all here are potential APCs, I enter in the lymphoid organ and attach many of you, I must choose, sense the strength or quality of antigenic stimulation, and my job is to help the best among you to progress. So if, for example, Federica is a B cell that has uptaken a lot of antigen because it's an high affinity B cell receptor, I should choose to help her and not another because he, she is the cells that has to produce the high affinity antibody. And the same thing is for a, for a dendritic cell that has phagocyted the, the pathogen. So the idea of the helper cells is to use these uh, plastic synapses to choose among which APC it should be Del delivered the help in a selective fashion. On the contrary, the CTLs use this plasticity, this capacity to sense different cells in the opposite way. So if I can go there, if I am a CTL and all your colleagues there are an, epithelial, uh, an epithelium, which each one is a cell that is getting infected by a virus, I arrive in the epithelium, I'm specific for the virus, I cannot stay with one cell, for example, the girl in front, and very calmly and slowly kill this person, this, uh, this cell, and after move to another. I must be extremely rapid, and also not extremely selective, like a sergeant. The CTL should go there and very rapidly eliminate any potential um, uh, dangerous cell 
even if one cell has only one peptide MHC or five peptide MHC, and it's just getting <laughs> contaminated, uh, it's important to kill this cell before the virus spread. So the idea is that the two, two cells use uh, multiple and dynamic con contacts for a completely different purpose, to be more efficient. So with this idea, our uh, observation was somehow difficult to reconcile with the well-known uh, established model put forth by Gillian Griffith and colleagues, uh, of which we have uh, already confirmed data, that the, um, the secretion of lytic granules, so the lytic lit delivery by CTLs via secretion of lytic granules, requires a reorganization of the CTL um, uh, cytoskeleton, tubulin cytoskeleton, the MTOC that normally is behind the nucleus, so in the back of the CTL during locomotion, as to reorganize toward the synapse, repolarize toward the synapse, and the lytic granules use the, um, the tubules like tracks. They go close to the area of contact where the MTC is touching the membrane and are secreted in a specialized secretory domain. We all, all observed this in, st in still images, in fixed T cell EPC conjugates, but this kind of observation was somehow difficult to reconcile with this multiple killing idea. Is the MHC oscillating extremely rapidly among the cells? To address this question, the first approach we had was to try to inhibit the polarization of the MHC at the contact site between the CTL and the target cell in order to see what would happen to the capacity to kill if this phenomenon of polarization of the MHC would be inhibited. To add this point, we focused on the PKC zeta because this uh, polarizing pathway of this enzyme, PKC zeta, and this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, partner, molecular partner, has been uh, shown in many uh, biological systems to be crucial for establishing the cellular polarity. And we have in, also in agreement with other groups like the group of Clary Ivrotz showed that for helper T cell polarization, the, the pathway of uh, PKC zeta is uh, important, is implicated in reorganization of the secretory machinery of helper T cells toward the target cell. So we asked whether also in uh, CTLs the polarization of the MHOC could be controlled by the PKC zeta pathway. We knew from T cell data, but we repeated for CTL, that we, could, we had also a very useful pharmacological tool to uh, study this phenomenon because there is a, a pseudo-substrate inhibitor of PKC zeta that is selective, pe cell permeant, and also very importantly not toxic at all for T cell responses. Here is shown calcium flux in the presence uh, um, or, in, or in the absence of this inhibitor that is called PKC zeta PS. And here is shown interferon gamma, but really all the assay we studied show that this inhibitor of PKC zeta does not affect the signaling, the productive signaling via the T cell receptor, both in helper and in cytotoxic lymphocyte, which makes this a precious uh, molecule. You know very well how tough is, diff, how tough is some time to silence molecules in, uh, in uh, non-transformed uh, human lymphocytes. So, we, uh, having this tool, we wanted before uh, confirm that also in CTL, uh, the PKC zeta pathway will be activated at the immunological synapse. And this is shown here. The cells are uh, formed, conjugates are formed between uh, um, uh, CTLs and non-cognate or cognate uh, target cells. And petir staining to show the phosphotyrosine activation is in blue and uh, a PKC zeta, uh, phospho PKC zeta is shown in green. This antibody stains a phosphorated form of the PKC zeta that is the activated form of the, of the molecule. And as you can see here in green or here in a pseudo color scale, this is PKC zeta in pseudo color scale, this enzyme is actually activated in the contact side between a T cell and the cognate specific target cell. These data were done using uh, uh, target cell pulsed with, uh, uh, with TSST2, T TST1 and the V-beta-2 polyclonal CTL, freshly isolated CTL. But we have repeated all the data I present today with antigen-specific T-cell lines or clones. So the idea is that we um, wanted to have two kinds of model, and I will present today something done with clones, something done with uh, V-beta-2 cells. One polyclonal and freshly isolated, but obviously less specific than the peptide, and the other <laughs> really uh, recognizing the antigenic ligand, but obviously 
a line that we kept in culture for a long time. In both systems, we had this activation that is measured in uh, many T cell APC conjugates uh, by uh, using metamorph software. Having observed that the, the, the enzyme, the pathway is activated, we tried to block it using the pseudo substrate inhibitor. And uh, uh, the data are presented here. Here there is a typical uh, CTL target cell conjugate and the conjugate is unpulsed. And you can see the MTOC in green here and the, the lytic granules in blue and the cell is not polarized. In situation in which there is the specific ligand, in this case the superantigen, there is a clear polarization of the MTOC with all around the lytic granules, so confirming what <coughs> we have always seen, that the molecules move together. And uh, this is a situation in which the, the antigen, the superantigen is present on the surface of the target cell, but the, the T cell has been pretreated and washed with the PKCZ inhibitor that inhibits the polarization of the MTOC toward the target cell. The quantification of this data is shown here in different uh, experiments. The distance between the MTOC and the synapse is long, is large in unpulsed situation, becomes short in unpulsed situation, and longer again in situation in which the target is pulsed, but the PKC zeta is inhibited in the target cell. We wanted to be sure that we were really looking at the complex uh, containing MTOC and the centrosome. To do this, we performed force color staining in which we stained uh, as a marker of centrosome position the gamma tubulin, whereas the microtubules were stained with anti-alpha tubulin antibody here in light blue. The perforin was red and the target cell was highlighted by this dark blue color. And we could show that in condition in which we were, uh, this is an untreated conjugate, uh, <coughs> pe peptide pulsed uh, untreated conjugate, and you can see here the typical polarization of all the machinery toward the target cell. And this situation in which the peptide pulsed um, uh, uh, cells are in contact with CTLs that have been pretreated with the inhibitor of the PKC zeta. And you can see that the MTOC and lytic granules, uh, the big portion of lytic granules, are far. But uh, there is also the staining of the gamma tubulin here, indicating that uh, the entire polarizing um, uh, mechanism is far, far, let's say, is, not, is inhibited in this uh, movement toward the, toward the target cell. So in this condition, in this condition, if the uh, idea that we all have that you need to remove the MTOC toward the target cell in order to kill, to deliver the little lit. In this condition, one would expect that uh, although this inhibition is not total, complete, but it's really strong, one would expect that somehow uh, uh, cytotoxicity exhibited by this CTL would be inhibited or at least strongly reduced. But this is not the case because when we studied the uh, cytotoxicity at different effector target ratio, either in superantigen stimulated lines or in antigen stimulated lines, and also, I don't show here, but also by playing with the dose response of antigen, we could also use different concentration. We don't, did not observe uh, detectable uh, inhibition of uh, cytotoxicity, indicating that in some way, in this condition, or in this, uh, same, this condition, CTL, could still kill. A few little granules could be secreted at the synaptic area, even in this condition. To address this point, we initially started to study the exposure of LAMP1, CD107A, that, as you know, is a component of little granules that is exposed on the surface of CTL after, during the granulation. It's called the smoking gun of the CTL. If you consider CTL killers, the Lamp 1 is the smoking gun that indicates that the CTL has killed, has degranulated, okay? And by FACS analysis, we observed the exposure of this molecule was not inhibited by the pretreatment and washing of CTL with this inhibitor of PKC zeta that strongly inhibits the polarization of the CTL. But we also observed this phenomenon by uh, microscopy. So the cells were um, fixed, stained with uh, the antibody against LAMP1 after permeabilized and stained with anti-microtubule uh, antibody in order to see the polarization of microtubule and the exposure of LAMP1 after only three minutes of conjugates. LAMP1 can be detected if you are very early in this kind of conjugation at the contact site and after diffuse all around the T cell. 
And uh, in, the, in un, non inhibited condition, in condition in which PKC zeta works normally, the MTOC goes to the synapse and lamp 1 is exposed at the synapse. But in condition in which this inhibition occurs, the MTOC is relatively far from the synapse and lamp 1 exposure still occurs, indicating that this phenomenon of secretion can be initiated in condition in which the MTOC of the CTL is physically far from the immunological synapse. We wanted to have a more direct evidence of this kind of, of data. The data I'm presenting are done by initial, generated by Flori Bertrand and uh, continued by uh, Sabina Muller, who did uh, most of this um, time lapse acquisition. And uh, uh, you can see here what happens. This is a, a CTL that has been loaded with a tubule tracker to detect the position of the MTOC here in green. Liso tracker, that is a marker of endosome lysosome. On the contrary, the target cell, I might stop it here one moment, the target cell is loaded with fluor 4AM. That is a probe that increases the green color, the green emission, when the calcium flux in the target cell. And it's been uh, observed in the past by Smith Verus Tempoeni and uh, by Lieberman, Judy Lieberman, and also confirmed by us that when target cells re receive lithic granules, lit its, little lits, let's say, um, they have a sort of uh, damage of their membrane that is um, uh, translated in a rapid calcium flux. Is the perforin the, that uh, somehow induces this kind of calcium flux response in target cells. So it was to use this phenomenon, calcium flux, as an evidence of detection of uh, little lit by target cells in order to see where the MTC was positioned in this, um, uh, in this situation, where the MTC was uh, in the time in which the little lit could be detected in target cell. Because surprising, as we were discussing, although we all believe and we can see that the MTOC goes together with the, the lytic granules at the synapse, all these data were always based on fixed APC tar uh, target T cell CTL conjugates. Never this kind of data were looked at by time lapse microscopy. So continuing, uh, I can go back, uh, by looking at this uh, phenomenon, here you can see the target cell, the, the CTL has been pretreated with the PKC inhibitor. So everything is a little bit slow. This is a slow movie because also the cells, as showed before by, uh, by Jerome Delon, are, let, are relatively less dynamic. But in a while, you will see calcium flux here. Without the polarization, this is the first spike. In a while, you see the lytic granules on the contrary are there. Now there will be a second one. And the, the MTOC is far. There will be a sort of phenomenon of multiple killing. We are not sure because there is another CTL here. But we believe that CTL does not touch. And in a while, you will see the second one fluxing. And the MTOC will be clearly in between the two. And this other cell will start to flux, indicating that there is even this kind of multiple killing. So this was the kind of data we, we had. But we wanted to have a more precise definition of this phenomenon of capacity of deliver at least a few um, lytic granules at the contact site with, uh, with a target cell in condition in which the MTOC in polarization was inhibited. I don't want to bore you with too many data. Please focus on this one. This is the positive control. This is a CTL. This is polarizing at its MTOC and its lytic granules in blue towards the target cell. The red color is a CD45. That is a molecule that is excluded from the central synaptic area. And this is a, a CTL that is touching two target cells simultaneously and has been treated, treated with an inhibitor of the PKC zeta. So the MTOC do, does not polarize neither with this cell nor with the other. But uh, there are a few, very few little granules moving towards this cell and other, other more detectable moving towards this cell, while the big package of uh, lytic granule is still wrapped around the MTC, indicating that really the lytic granule find their way towards the target cell in condition in which the MTC polarization is inhibited. And this is uh, the, let's say, analysis using the MRIS software of this kind of conjugate. So all these data were interesting because they were indicating that by using a, a way to block this very rapid MTC polarization, because the MTC polarization is complete in about three minutes, by using this way to extend this window of time, using this inhibitor of PKC zeta, we could see that 
because zeta is really required for MHC polarization, but that this MHC polarization is somehow dispensable for little granule secretion at the contact side area as shown by lamp expression, 3D microscopy, uh, time-lapse microscopy, and so on. But these data were still obtained using an inhibitor, a pharmacological inhibitor that somehow could affect the CTL function. So we asked whether there was a possibility to study this kind of phenomenon using relatively rapid microscopy to see whether um, this phenomenon that the lytic granules could be secreted at the contact side with target cells could be seen also in condition in which the CTL was not inhibited in its polarization response. So we had to use some fast method in order to see in a very narrow window of time, in these few minutes, if the lytic granules could arrive before uh, MTOC um, and be delivered to the target cells before the MTOC polarization. We use, use uh, several approaches. I present here three. The first approach was again to repeat this kind of movies we did before, but trying to be very uh, rapid in finding the good T cell APC conjugates. So again, the, the target cells are loaded with uh, fluorophore. They also have a little tracker red inside because this is uh, a leaky probe. And the tubulin tracker is uh, to stain the T cells. This is a target cell. And when the T cell lands on the target cell, you can see in a while that there is the calcium flux here. And the MTOC is still there. If you look very, very carefully, you can even see a few little granules that move very rapidly through, towards the target cell. We have seen several times. Indicated that you, we can even see this. But this is a confocal access scanning microscopy with one imaging every seven seconds. So this was a relatively too slow microscopy approach because one could consider that during this seven seconds, the MTOC could have moved very rapidly toward the target cell. And so deliver a few little granules and after go back in that situation. This would be reasonable also because the MTOC never goes back. When the MTOC goes there, stays for minutes up to hours. But we had a discount of doubt, so we used another approach. This approach was done in collaboration with colleagues at Stanford University, in which we used the turf to monitor the dynamic of little granules and of the MTOC. So the CTLs were again loaded with the two probes to detect microtubules and lytic granules. And in this case, for the turf, as you know, the stimulus is not a cellular stimulus, but is a plastic, let's say not plastic, uh, let's say immobilized um, uh, stimulus that uh, uh, allows the CTL to sit on the chamber, on the, on the slide, on the cover lips. And uh, by sitting on this, you can see the dynamics of molecules and fast. So you have to imagine that you are behind the cover zip and you see the CTL sitting on you and you can see all the molecules arriving in the, in the field. And as you know, the turf allows to look at a very narrow area because it's made in a manner that you see only events that are in about 100 nanometers behind the plasma membrane, so beneath the plasma membrane. So it's something extremely narrow. What enters in the turf is supposed to be secreted, for example, or at least to go in contact with the membrane. In this case, the, the, the stimulus was an antigen-specific cell. So these were antigen-specific T cells that were stimulated by an antigen-specific stimulus. So this was the advantage of this system. And uh, I'm sorry, and in this situation, um, we could see that by turf analysis, there were three kinds of, uh, of, let's say, behavior, major behavior. There was even a fourth one. In some, about 16, 17% of the movies, the MTOC could be seen immediately when the CTL was landing on the, on the cover zip, was seen immediately in the, in the turf area, and it was really clearly with all the macrotubules. And the, the little granules could appear later on or even um, very early, but somehow the MTOC was seen there. In, in agreement with the, the model that we all believe that you need to have the MTOC in order to deliver the little granules towards the secretory area. But in other situation, the MTOC was almost either not at all detected. So the little granules were seen before, and after you could see a, a few tubules appearing. But there was a lot of granules arriving independently from the MTOC appearance in the turf area. Or the little granules, could, the MTOC could be at the beginning of the movie, but after there was disappearing very, very rapidly from the turf analysis. Or as I was saying, these were about 80% together of the 
case, or otherwise could be present, but in some case, you could see, I cannot stop it well, in some case, you could see that granules could be also visible in the TIRF area pretty far from the MTOC. So somehow there was a clear spatio-temporal dissociation between the entry of the MTOC in the area of secretion and the disposition of granules in the area of secretion. Again, suggesting that uh, you don't really need uh, always the contact of any MTOC of the plasma membrane in order to de deliver the granules. This uh, data don't exclude that MTOC could be just be behind in, in the, just behind the turf area, you know, to fuel lytic granules there. We don't exclude this, and actually we, we believe that this is the case. But really the contact is not required. To have an, and this, uh, the advantage of this, of this kind of uh, data where that the images were one image in four seconds, so making even less, less possible that there could be a very rapid entry of the MTC and go back. But to exclude again this, this situation, we went back to our uh, useful way of looking uh, deliver little lit in target cells, and we used again a confocal laser scanning microscope. This is the limit we have there. We are going to install a, a very efficient spinning disk system in a couple of months, but by, by using a rapid acquisition uh, scanning system and by loading cells only with one color, so tubulin tracker for the T cell and flow 4 am for the target cell, we could make movies in which the images were detected at every 0 0.5 seconds, and again, we look at, at the, although the quality, the resolution of the images is not so beautiful, so clear as before, and we could see the uh, rise in calcium flux in target cells in parallel with the polarization of the MTOC. And you can see here, this, I, I had to stop, that in condition in which the MTOC is not yet arrived, I had to stop very rapidly, the calcium flux starts here, and after you see the end of the movie, indicating that even by using this very rapid uh, acquisition, you can detect uh, in about half of the CTL target cell conjugates the initiation of calcium flux in target cells before the arrival of the MTOC. And by, by analyzing this data on this kind of conjugates uh, in, uh, in parallel, using a paired statistical test to see in each conjugate the time required to see calcium flux in uh, the target, compared in the same conjugate to the time required to see the polarization of the MTOC in the conjugate, we obtained a dramatically clear phenomenon in which, in any case, the, the calcium flux was initiating before, although this phenomenon was variable, and in some cases was de detectable during the first minute <laughs> after contact. So during the first minute after contact between T cells and target cells, target cells were starting calcium flux. Taken together with uh, this uh, previous data, this data by showing that uh, the TERF um, uh, experiments show this sort of uh, spatio temporal dissociation uh, among the, the MTC and, uh, and uh, lytic glands. I forgot to mention that already a German group has shown this uh, using anti CD3 uh, antibody bound to, to, to cover slips, that there is this dissociation. And uh, um, by showing that uh, this uh, extremely rapid step of uh, lytic granule uh, secretion that can be somehow detected before the rapid polarization of MUC, together with the data presented before with inhibitor, we, we believe that we have identified a, an initial rapid step of lytic granule secretion that precedes macrotubular polarization and that somehow indicates that uh, the delivery of lytic lit by CTL might not always occur as we all believed before via this uh, Repolarization MTC followed by lytic granules, but maybe there could be this phenomenon that could be important in situation in which CTL interact, for example, with multiple target cells in order to extremely rapidly deliver DITs to the different targets. I would like to dedicate other three, four minutes. I can, no, I, I, what is my time? It's okay? It's okay? Just very short. To our uh, uh, approach of somehow translating. Our uh, know-how about the immunological synapse in humans in terms of techniques and also of uh, knowledge from the culture dish to the, to the human pathology. And I will present some data we obtained on follicular lymphoma. But I must say that this is the most, let's say, important project we have in the lab. We invest a lot of energies to study this kind of things using two photon microscopy to really see this kind of phenomenon in, in real time in live tissue, human tissues, because we have a strong collaboration with hematologists and pathologists in Toulouse and in Rome. 
But unfortunately, today I cannot present this data because it's a little bit preliminary. But I hope in, in a while I could show this kind of things in real time, as I was showing in the culture dish, in real time in tissues. But this is not for, for today. So what we did as in a first uh, study, a, a pathologist in the lab, Camille Laurent, who worked for her PhD, she is an MD pathologist and she got the PhD with us, focused on CTL and follicular lymphoma because it was known that this um, nonogic lymphoma is characterized by a sort of indolent course. Um, it's a relatively not very aggressive tumor that uh, is also influenced a lot by the composition of the immunological microenvironment. For example, the genes bound to T cells, CD8 cells, appear to be more positive for prognosis than genes uh, uh, related to some uh, kind of macrophages and so on. But these data were never studied using uh, confocal microscopy, so the methods classically used for synapse. So Camille started to use uh, uh, classical immunohistochemistry to stain uh, uh, these samples from uh, follicular lymphoma patients. These are lymph nodes, and this uh, big stuff here is the follicle, is the disease, is the B cell follicle that is enormous. There are many B cells that are, you know, let's say, the tumoral B cells. And by staining with CD anti CD10 antibody, she could find that there is in some patients, in about half of the patients, a strong infiltrate of CD8 that are also granzyme positive in the uh, perifollicular uh, area around the follicles. So the CD8 cells don't enter too much in the follicle, but they stay around them. And this was in about uh, an half of the patients analyzed. She wanted to see this kind of phenomenon more uh, in detail using a non-subjective method. So she used the confocal microscopy also to be sure that these cells were really CTLs in order to use a three-color staining. And so she stained the uh, interfollicular space of follicular lymphoma samples compared to reactive lymph nodes, uh, so lymph nodes that don't uh, have this kind of, uh, of disease. And uh, um, uh, for CD8, CD3, and Granzyme B, to identify CTL in this, uh, in this, um, in this interfollicular species. And she found that in the interfollicular space of follicular lymphoma, there were more frequently CTLs, and more important, the CTLs detected in the reactive lymph nodes were very rare, and more important, just by looking by eyes, they were appearing very rich in lithium granules. They were, we were calling them some sort of uh, a big ship full of, uh, of uh, of lithium granules. Confocal microscopy compared to uh, uh, immunochemistry allows easy non-subjective quantification of uh, morphological data. So she could stain in the follicular, analyze in the follicular space of different patients the number of CTL as compared to reactive lymph nodes. And she found an increased number of CTL in, the, in patients than in a reactive lymph node. But she could also put uh, a region around the T cells and analyze the content in lithium granules, so the strength of lithium granules staining in the, the follicular versus in reactive lymph nodes. And she found that at individual level, cell level, any CTL was not only more in number, more uh, numerous, but also any CTL was more charged in um, lithium granules, indicating somehow CTL in follicular lymphoma are more armed than normal CTLs. This was done using a non-subjective, automatic way of measuring. Having observed this, Camille wanted to ask whether and if some sort of interaction between the CTLs and the tumoral B cells could occur during uh, the disease, let's say, in the course of the disease. Remember that here we are with patients, and uh, being with patients, we cannot make experiments. So we had to use this biopsis, stain the biopsis, and looking uh, in biopsis uh, at a certain time if we could find interaction between CTLs and uh, tumoral cells. So the, the, the samples were stained with CD79A, a marker of B cells, CD3 and granzyme to detect the CTLs. And we could see that some encounters between these cells could be detected in the samples, and normally always at the border between the follicle and the interfollicular space, as shown here in this 3D reconstruction of the, of the tissue of the, of the, of the, of the 
sample. And when, uh, in some cases, the B cells were found to go out of the follicle, some sort of going out of the follicle to, let's say, expand, maybe to go towards the, the bone marrow, the CTLs were found somehow to be there to intercept this uh, B cell and by forming uh, really some sort of lytic synapse, very reminiscent of what we saw in vitro. We wanted uh, uh, to know whether this kind of uh, interaction could somehow result in a sort of immune surveillance. This, again, cannot be done in patients. But to have a sort of way to see if there was a sort of immune surveillance, Camille did a very patient, always a 3D analysis, in which she stained the B cells for um, caspase 3, the activated caspase 3, that is a marker of ongoing apoptosis. Uh, because activated caspase 3 is obviously in the cascade of apoptosis, and she could very patiently measure the, in the different position of the lymph node where these cells were enriched, and she found a moderate but significant enrichment of these cells always at the perifollicular area and always in contact with CTL, indicating that at least from what we can see from ex vivo data, CTL and uh, B cell form synaptic like contacts in which a certain number of them undergo apoptosis. Having this data, we were looking for some sort of correlation between our CTLs in these samples and the disease progression, because one would expect that there are all these killer cells. You might in infer that the disease has a better course. But to our surprise, for several times, long time, we didn't find any correlation the patients could have a very serious disease at the time of diagnosis or a less serious, uh, even if they had a lot of CTL or not, in terms of, you know, diffusion, state of, uh, of health, and things like this. But a very important correlation was found when we um, analyzed, uh, in parallel, the response of the patients over a long time of a court that went back to uh, 10 years, the response of these uh, people to the the, the therapy of choice that is rituximab plus chemotherapy. And, uh, um, uh, and these people, the group A, that was the patients that in at the beginning, at the time of diagnosis, had a lot of uh, granzyme positive CTL, compared to the group B, the patients that at the time of the diagnosis didn't have detectable many CTLs, the group A was behaving much better in terms of the response of, of therapy since the relapses were much lower, uh, let's say, delayed and less important. So the presence of CTL in uh, the follicular lymphoma at the time of therapy confirm a sort of protection to the patients since they respond better to the therapy. And the grain time B can be used as uh, a marker of, uh, to predict the response to the, to the therapy. We are, as I was saying before, investing a lot of energies to study this in uh, real time in samples that are kept alive from the operation room to the, to the lab in order to understand how this occurs and whether this could be exploited to ameliorate the immune response mediated by CTLs to this tumor and obviously also to other tumors which might be more aggressive. So I will stop here and I would like to thank past and present members of the lab. I only put in, in green the person which I presented the data. So Camille is the pathologist of this last part. Flori and Sabina are the killer girls. I didn't present data from Claire, who is a mathematician, but since we are going to be, uh, let's say, captured, uh, these data are not published yet, but we are also making uh, some mathematical modeling of uh, how CTL attack tumors in order to better understand how uh, this phenomenon of attack and defense uh, uh, happens. And I also present uh, all the data from mast cells were done by Eric Espinosa uh, uh, and Nicola Godenzio. These are the collaborators, and thank you for, uh, for your attention.